So welcome to everybody. And this evening we're delighted to welcome archaeologist Dr. Aaron Watson. And Aaron completed his doctorate in archaeology at the University of Reading. Um, and his research interests are in Neolithic and Bronze Age archaeology. Um, and he's conducted field work um, at rock art sites all across Britain for over 30 years. So um, I'm, re I'm really lucky because I get to work alongside Aaron um, as he's also the museum's interpretation and engagement manager. So uh, thanks very much, Julia, and welcome everybody. This was a uh, slightly tricky presentation in a way to put together because of course so many people in our audience will be very familiar indeed with Kilmartin Glen's archaeology and others may not know it quite so well at all. So I'm going to do a combination of introducing the Glen for those who are not so familiar but the others, if uh, you do know the, this, 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 this amazing place well, please do bear with me for these introductory images. Kilmartin Glen is located on the west coast of Scotland. And why we're all here today is because Kilmartin Glen is the focus for one of the most significant groups of. Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments in Britain. These monuments include stone circle, standing stones, and this linear cemetery of burial cairns, which you can see in the picture right now. And what we're here for uh, today, of course, is that the Glen is also one of the principal concentrations of open air rock art in Western Europe. Sites such as Cairnban, which you're seeing right now, but also Ormeg and Aknebrek are famous for their cup and ring carvings. Now, cup and ring carvings like these are part of a wider tradition, and it's known as Atlantic rock art. And it's called Atlantic rock art because very similar designs are found all along the west coast of Europe, extending from Scotland south to Portugal. Now, there's obviously been a little bit of uh, investigation into the dates and origins for rock art, and it varies in different areas. But I think for what we're talking about today, we can put a range of these markings being Neolithic and Bronze Age, and probably dating predominantly between 3000 BC and 1500 BC. So this is something which is, which largely has its origins around about five millennia ago. Cup and ring markings are arguably one of the most enigmatic legacies of prehistory. And I think that's because they're created using or largely using abstract geometric shapes, dots, circles, and lines. This has invited quite a lot of speculation and of course debate about their original purpose and their meaning. Indeed, the difficulties of interpreting rock art were summarized really well in 1979 in a book by the eminent rock art researcher, Ronald Morris. He compiled a list of over a hundred different suggestions as to what these markings might have been intended to mean. Many of those suggestions for their use are popular still today. And just as an example of things that he listed, he included, could they be maps of the landscape? Could there be stars uh, in the night sky? Could they be ripples from a stone thrown into a pool of water? Or could they just be idle, pointless doodling? All those ideas have been put out there as possible explanations. 
what I'd like to consider is how interpretation might be uh, of rock art might be thought about in the light of recent archaeological research, or at least research from 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 the past few decades. I'd like to consider whether there are different ways in which we might connect together these rather perplexing dots. The fundamental motif, I guess you could call it, motif being an image, a symbol, is the cut mark. And there is a cut mark at the centre, at the bottom of the image on the screen. A cut mark is a circular hollow pecked into the rock using a hammer stone. Now, cut marks can be found quite isolated, a bit like this one, looking a bit lonely there, but they are also a fundamental component in rather more complex designs, where they often occupy the centre of circles and concentric circles. Now, these are quite coherent compositions, I would suggest, and they certainly follow loosely defined systems of organisation. So while cut marks and cut marks with rings around them may join together, and you can see lines on this image where different motifs are connected by grooves, these images don't ever obviously overlap or seem to erase one another. So those basic patterns, to me, suggest that rock art is unlikely, for instance, to be something like idle doodling. It's not likely to be something that anyone took lightly in prehistory for many reasons, but partly because they took such enormous amount of effort to produce, but they're also made with this great intent and consistency all across Britain and Ireland and, of course, beyond. I do wonder whether the rather fixed and often figurative explanations um, and interpretations which dominate the list that Ronald Morris compiled is a little bit in part of the way that archaeologists like myself sometimes represent rock art in the form of illustrations, um, printed media, um, and diagrams like the one you're seeing now. The reason why I think this, this can be an issue is that the survey techniques which archaeologists use are primarily concerned with simplifying information. And this is an image from a uh, field work that I undertook uh, on Ben Laws, which is in the Southern Highlands. And here is a piece of rock art being surveyed. And what you can see in this image is the archaeologist essentially looking down at the ground, but not at that amazing view of Loch Tay beyond. And that focus down on the image resulted in this diagram, which was then used in the publication of the project. And of course, what's interesting is, is what's missing between this experience out in the landscape and what's translated into the two-dimensional, rather static, rather monochromatic image which uh, excludes a lot of those elements. The other issue, I think, with a diagram like this is that, of course, they reproduce rock art as we see it today. And if we were to say, oh, might the designs that, that are on the screen now resemble ripples in water? Well, the diagram might imply that. But of course, the diagram is taking place outside the formation of these images, which may have taken decades, generations, or even centuries to complete. We can't be entirely sure of that chronology in all cases, of course. But what would happen to that interpretation of ripples 
if only one ring was added every few decades or over hundreds of years. So the problem we've got is that plans like this are really critical for archaeology because they create a really clear, objective record of the past. But at the same time, we need to also be aware that they have effects on our interpretation. They take these images outside of their landscape context, and they also take them outside of time, if you like. But archaeologists certainly do also consider these places within their landscape setting. And this is Akna Brack Rock Art site in its landscape setting, has an amazing view, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Now, looking at the locations of rock art sites has been useful, and it, it actually reveals some significant differences. And it seems that differences in the carvings themselves reflect their contrasting locations in the landscape. It's not a pattern which is absolutely fixed or rigid in every area that rock art occurs, but it's a general theme that we see in many areas. In the Kilmartin area, for example, the most elaborate carvings, by which I mean the most complex, the ones with most rings or the ones that are joined together a lot, they're often found in higher locations on raised ground. They often have wide views and they can be either close to or overlooking route ways through the landscape. So Cairn Ban and Aknebrek here, they overlook one of the major valley approaches to Kilmartin Glen from the south. In contrast, another Kilmartin site, or Meg, seen here, is situated on what is essentially a, a pass or a, a, a narrow routeway, which leads from a sheltered sea loch into Kilmartin Glen itself. So once again, a complex site seems associated with an important connection through the landscape. Now, one of the most important and significant contributions to our understanding of rock art in recent years has emerged from the excavation of these sites. And archaeology hasn't been exploring rock art in this way for very long indeed. And some of these excavations, which took place, I think it was between 2004 and 2007, they were some or among the earliest excavations around rock art sites anywhere in Britain or Ireland. And they were led by Professor Andrew Jones of Southampton University. The fieldwork investigated two sites. The first one you see here are three outcrops which bear cup and ring markings at a place called Torvlaren in Kilmickle Glen which is a parallel glen to the east of Kilmartin Glen. And the second site that was investigated, and this, this, this part of the project took place in collaboration with Kilmartin Museum, was at the Ormeig rock art site. But if we go back to Torvlaren, the excavations around the three outcrops in that location, they uncovered more than 40 quartz hammerstones. And you can see some photographs which depict those hammerstones. In addition to these artifacts, they also found over 10,000 pieces of broken, fractured, and shattered quartz. Now, much of this broken, shattered material was found within these fissures, these joints and lines that cross the surface of the outcrop. And the remainder that wasn't located within these fissures upon the rock was found around their margins. And that's where you can see the archaeologists excavating in this image. 
So how could we explain this evidence, the hammer stones and all this broken quartz? Well, we worked with artifact specialist Hugo Anderson Weimark, and he investigated the quartz assemblage as a whole and found by undertaking experiments, so going out into the landscape, collecting quartz pebbles, finding bits of rock that were identical to the ones that have been carved, like you see in the picture, and actually experimentally making new rock art on these little panels of rock, he was able to identify that those distinctive fractures and the, the hammer stones, the, I suppose, the sort of diagnostic use and wear and breakage lines on the hammer stones themselves could only have resulted from the quartz pebbles having been used to make rock art, which is absolutely fascinating. What a brilliant thing to find the tools that are being made to use these carvings, which have otherwise been so elusive and so enigmatic. Some of that broken quartz that was covering the rocks and had gone into the fissures and around the rocks is likely to also be the remains of these hammer stones that had simply fallen apart while being used to make the cup and ring markings. So a great deal of, of debris had actually arisen as the rock was being struck and those hammer stones simply broke apart. Now, an important part of the project was to see if it was possible to date the creation of rock art and particularly cup and ring rock art in the Atlantic tradition because it's been notoriously difficult to date because you can't simply, there's no technique to measure when a mark was made on a rock or at least not these kinds of marks on these kinds of rocks out in the landscape. So the Hammerstones provided an opportunity because if these were being used to make the rock art and we then found a hammerstone in association with organic material that could be radiocarbon dated, it might not date exactly when that rock, when that hammer was used, but you get a much better idea than through almost any other technique we have access to. And in one of the fissures on one of the rocks at Torvlaren, the best dates that came back for the hammer stones, so they'd been used to make rock art and then deposited, probably not after a very long interval, to be honest, otherwise they'd be lost or moved or get washed off the rocks. But those, those dates suggested that the hammer stones had been deposited between about 2900 and 2700 BC which would place this particular site into the later Neolithic. But for me, fascinating as that is, what the project really brought home and emphasized is that rock art isn't just visual images, it's actually the the result, the outcome, the, the signature of some kind of dynamic action that's been undertaken on the rock surface. So every hammerstone or every one of those quartz fragments has resulted from somebody, quite possibly in the later Neolithic, striking the rock to make these carvings. And of course, when they're striking the rock, it reminds us that these aren't static abstract diagrams that I've shown you already, or even photographs in the present day. These are places that people are visiting, maybe gathering at, and they are there to make rock art on rocks that previously had no carvings on before, or maybe they already had carvings that were being added to. But whatever that scenario, they're there with hammer stones, and every time they strike or peck the rock surface, they are creating that debris and a percussive sound. So 
although we might think of rock art as being a visual medium, its creation is all about percussion. It makes a percussive sound. And so it actually becomes a rather more multi-sensory experience than we might expect. What's, I think, very interesting about this is that at Torvaren, quartz was being deliberately chosen as the material to make cup and ring marks. And it was being chosen in preference to other kinds of pebbles that you can fish out of the, the, the burn nearby, which would be much better or more suited at the role they were going to perform. So there were more robust or hardier pebbles available, but people in the Neolithic, a bit later, they chose quartz over those other materials. And one of the ways we might explain this is because quartz has some quite distinctive and also unusual properties. And one of those properties is it's a translucent or semi-translucent crystal. So you can see light shining through it. Some of it's partly transparent. So when rock art was being made, you've got the people or the person on the rock. You've got the quartz hammerstones, which have been found locally, but selected. But when they're using those hammerstones, they're creating the wear patterns we can see on those artifacts, but they're also creating considerable quantities of dust, which is very fine and floats around in the air, and it coats you when you're making the rock art so that you start to sparkle as the rock art maker. And you also get these fragments of quartz, which litter the rock surface. These obviously catch the light and they completely transform how these rocks would have appeared during the process that the rock art itself was being made. And finally, and I was really tempted to try and demonstrate this, but I didn't think it might work with cameras and over the internet. But if you rub or grate two blocks of quartz together, they emit light. And it's a phenomenon called triboluminescence. And it's a remarkable thing. And the light that two bits of quartz uh, rubbed together emits is very clearly visible in low light, certainly in darkness. It's the kind of thing you would see at dusk or dawn before you get full daylight. And I think what's interesting about this rocks that glow is that, of course, I mean, I still think that's pretty amazing now, but we do have a rational explanation for that. Science can tell us why quartz glows like that. But of course, people thousands of years ago, they wouldn't have shared our rational scientific understandings of why these rocks emit light. And I do think that maybe one of the reasons this material is being chosen amongst all those others is that it has these what could be magical properties for those people. The rock art, in other words, was being made from sound and light. Now, if that sounds quite spectacular, then it's interesting that there's evidence, certainly from Torvlaren and from some other sites that I've worked at outside of the Kilmartin area, that there seem to have been people gathering around these rocks. We know this at Torvlaren because where those archaeologists are troweling the ground, loads of bits of that broken quartz were found. But also when they got further down through the surface layers, they found soil that had been compacted. And it had been compacted most likely with bits of quartz trodden into it by people standing in that location. And it's the perfect place to stand to view somebody or people making those carvings on the rock above. 
Here's one of the other outcrops at Torvlaren that is also decorated with rock art. And I do wonder whether in a context like this, we might see rock art as, again, going beyond these static two-dimensional pictures and the way that we think of it as a visual medium in our mind's eye. Perhaps the creation of rock art is a much more theatrical event than we might have expected. And it involves all of those quite unusual and distinctive multi-sensory experiences. It also smells when you when you when you uh, create uh, when you use quartz to to hammer or you knock two bits of quartz together. You get all those effects and quite a strong smell. So this adds another dimension, I think, to rock art, and that is that perhaps the act of actually making these carvings was just as important as the shapes and patterns themselves. Let's move on to meaning. Rock art is still made by indigenous peoples in various parts of the world today. And ethnographers who've gone to meet with those people have found out some very interesting things about people who still make rock art, how they think about it, how they interpret the carvings or even paintings that they might create in the present day. I think one of the lessons that we can take away from that, from these ethnographic experiences and accounts is, and it's absolutely crucial, is that the meanings that people attach to shapes or symbols can change in relation to the context in which they're engaging with that rock art, with those symbols. The meanings can also change or be read differently according to who the observer themselves is. And that could be factors like their, their status in a society or their age or their gender. And this is really important because although we can't just impose those ethnographic uh, understandings and interpretations onto distant prehistory, because they might be completely unconnected. I think what those anthropological studies of present day people do is they offer us opportunities or insights to think in ways that we might not otherwise expect or anticipate. And in this case, it's the possibility that cup and ring markings might never have had a single static or literal or figurative meaning. So even if these designs, like this one here, were understood by somebody in prehistory as ripples, in a pool of water. This might not have been the only meaning that this motif possessed. So it's a warning to archaeology and to others that just to take care with imposing single or very figurative or very literate meanings. Yes, perhaps some of those meanings were acknowledged in the past, but there may have been many more and of course, those meanings may have changed with reference to who was looking or who was making the art. Those anthropological studies also tell us that meanings can be controversial even amongst the people who make the art. They can be contested. They can also be secret and not told to everybody. So maybe only specific people in the past had a full understanding of these markings. And in a way, we see that in the, in the present day, uh, not only in Ronald Morris's list, which has multiple interpretations, 
Now, we see those maybe as competing with one another, but perhaps several could be applicable or could have been true at the same time. And of course, we're also familiar with how symbols and shapes change according to context in the modern world as well. So uh, a, a, an example would be a cross shape has quite a different meaning if it's on the side of a medical emergency vehicle as opposed to if it's above an altar in a church. So things can shift and change according to their context. The other thing is that Neolithic understandings of stone itself are going to be very different to ours. And again, anthropolog anthropology can help us with this by revealing evidence from around the world of lots of different ways in which people interpret the medium of, of rock art, stone, and they can be fascinating. Some communities see stone as a living and animated substance, not the kind of cold, dead, aggregate of minerals that geology would suggest it to be. Um, rocks in some parts of the world are understood to be infused with supernatural powers. The markings can be made by ancestors, either human ancestors or supernatural ancestors. And it's interesting in the light of those ideas that there were very interesting events that took place at Torvlaren rock art site that were revealed through excavation. And this is an example of an arrangement of three rocks that was placed in a prominent fissure on the outcrop. And this is essentially a hammerstone in the middle, which is white, and it's flanked on either side by another piece of quartz that's been deliberately split in two. So you've got hammerstone that was probably used to make rock art being sandwiched, if you like, between two split quartz blocks and then placed and buried in a fissure on a decorated outcrop. And I do wonder whether this is some kind of symbolic deposit, a kind of an offering to the rock, perhaps. Other societies understand rocks as not being solid at all but they offer almost more of a permeable membrane, a means through which if you know how, if you have the right methods, you can actually journey through the surface of that rock into other dimensions below and beyond. Um, and maybe, just maybe, another suggestion to add to the list is, could these markings have been part of that process? So rather than representing something physical or tangible, are these actually a means of looking down through the surface of a rock, almost like a, a tunnel or a vortex leading downwards. There are also the kinds of images that are sometimes seen in the subconscious mind during altered states of consciousness. And there's a final dimension which I'd like to add to the mix and that is that cup and ring markings and this is the case in Kilmartin and elsewhere quite often appear alongside more unusual motifs which perhaps hint at wider connections and this example is Ormeg and you can see towards the center of this image the famous rosettes, which are larger cut marks with a circle of smaller cut marks around contained within a ring. And these were made using the same technique, it seems, as the other markings on this rock and elsewhere. But this design, the symbol, is itself a little bit more exotic. It's quite rare in landscape, open air rock art, but we do see it um, in Ireland where it's associated with 
Neolithic chambered monuments called passage tombs. So there's a possible connection here. Possible links are being made, not just with Ireland, but between Kilmartin and the, the wider Neolithic world. And the other place in Kilmartin where we see this really clearly is Aknebrek. The panel at Aknebrek that is currently pictured is highly unusual for an open air rock art site. And I've been undertaking a little bit of research recently, which is suggesting that the markings on this particular panel is quite a discreet area, only a few meters across but it features markings like the horn spiral in the lower left part of this image, which are very distinctive. Here's a plan of those unusual motifs at Aknebrek, horn spirals and open circles. And what I'm suggesting through a little bit of recent work that I've been doing is that these markings actually replaced yet earlier carvings, which are shown here in red, which are very fragmentary and faint and difficult to see. But the important thing here is this layering, the sense that you might have one thing that's replacing another, because that makes Aknebrek unique not only in Kilmartin Glen, but largely beyond. There are very, very few open air rock art sites which have evidence for this kind of superimposition of images one upon another. In fact, it's a hallmark that would be more often associated, again, with passage to art, and particularly in the Boyne Valley in Ireland. Now, some of the motifs that you would find in those passage tombs in Ireland are different to the ones we see here. And in fact, these spirals, here's a clearer photograph of one of these horn spirals, perhaps have their clearest parallels in Orkney, in the far north of Scotland, where they are also associated with chambered monuments. And that sequence of superimposition doesn't stop with spirals layering on top of fainter, possibly earlier designs, because there seems to be a further sequence here whereby these rare and more exotic images are themselves ultimately overlain by cup and ring markings, which are the main theme of, of this presentation. And this layering of the cup and ring markings upon and around the others is probably happening sometime in the centuries after 3000 BC. And that's because the reference for those spirals is found on monuments which are dated to be around about 3000 BC. So I suspect at Acne Breck, those references are slightly later and the cup and ring marks are being added later still. And I think this unique quality adds up to create a site which is exceptional in other ways as well. So Aknebrek, there's a picture here, is an enormous outcrop of rock compared to almost any others that are decorated in Britain and Ireland. It also features some of the largest carvings and some of the carvings which have most rings around the cut mark. Something special is happening here. And I'd like to think about why it was treated in such an exceptional and unusual way. In fact, it's so large that I read the markings here as having been organized almost into discrete zones or they, they accumulate over time. They map onto the rocks over time into a series of discrete areas. So the southern part of the outcrop is marked by cup and ring marks. And these cup and ring marks slope towards the base of the rock 
and they can be easily seen by people gathered around the outside of Aknebrek's outcrop. And this is where the present day visitor stands to see the motifs um, down on, on the rock surface. But in complete comparison to that, this panel with the spirals, the more unusual designs, the layering is right up on top of the rock, on the skyline in this image. So that if you're at the edge of the rock, anyone standing up there is set against the sky and you can't actually see the carvings. They are, they are inaccessible and they're, they're concealed. And I think that's very, very interesting that uh, there's a sense of if you weren't up there looking down onto that panel, you wouldn't see the motifs, but you might hear them being made, perhaps. You would know that there was some kind of performance taking place there. So there's a few elements that might add up, the size, the scale, and then there's the location. I think Achnebrecht's rock art also has an important relationship with the sky. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's situated on a ridge, so it's elevated in the landscape, overlooks the southern approach to Kilmartin Glen, so it's, it's in a really important location in relation to the movement of people. But in relation to the sky, viewed from here, look what happens to the winter sun as it crosses the, the sky in a low arc. What the low winter sun does is it frames the view of a sea loch, the sea which eventually extends into the Irish Sea. And it also frames, here's a close-up view, of the sun hanging in the sky at noon near the winter solstice. It also frames the mountainous silhouette of the Isle of Arran. And the light from that sun reflects off the waters of Loch Gilp and up onto the outcrop. Another key feature which adds together with those observations is the axis of the outcrop, is northeast, southwest, and that's reinforced by the cracks and the fissures that cross its surface. And this means that the entire outcrop and therefore the rock art that was added to it is together aligned on the mid-winter solstice sunset. And I wonder if this highest panel, and there's a spiral again in the foreground, was treated in special ways because it catches this light at the end of a mid-winter day. So Here's a little sequence that I've recorded of what happens as the sun sets around the winter solstice and those shadows lengthen. And you can see as I move through time, those shadows extend across the surface of this panel. And what happens is that there's a sequence again. The boulder carvings, the cup and ring marks, are the first to be prominent in most cases. But as the sun lowers and it becomes more oblique, increasingly those fainter, earlier carvings are revealed. The spirals, the open circles, and almost just before sunset, let's say round about there, you can begin to see the very faintest markings on this rock, which just simply cannot be easily seen at any other time. In a way, you could say that Aknebrek is playing out the history of its own creation in a theatrical experience of light and dark, which lasts for less than an hour. So I, I began this presentation with Ronald Morris's list of the many ways in which rock art has been interpreted in modern times. And I'm going to conclude with everything that I've talked about by saying that maybe rock art is less about representing 
rigid or specific ideas, but instead is itself about making meanings and also, as at Aknebrek, about making places. So these spirals and other early markings at Aknebrek may be some of the earliest in the area, and that's through parallels with the sites that they seem to reference in Orkney and perhaps also in Ireland. But if they are early, and they certainly predate the cup and ring marks, they were ultimately overlain by those cup and ring marks, which belong to this much wider, broader tradition. So over time, we could say that Aknebrek is being transformed into a story that's written into the stone itself. And that story certainly might have mirrored or perhaps even influenced changes in the wider landscape. And <coughs> what I will finish with is that those changes, for example, might relate to these spirals, which are carved on a standing stone at Temple Woodstone Circle, not far from Aknebrek. But interestingly, these carvings too, being spirals, exotic, unusual, also became partially concealed at a later stage in Temple Woods history when a ring can was built to envelop the standing stones, which is the stone rubble material that we see around those stones today. And that happened most likely in the early Bronze Age. So across the centuries, even cup and ring marks seem to have changed their role as well. And I think there's a bit of evidence, but the dating is not brilliant by any means, but it does seem that cup and ring markings expand from outcrops to increasingly be found on monuments such as standing stones in the wider landscape. And I'll, I'll end with an innovation, which is unique to Kilmartin Glen. And this concerns a kist slow within the cairn at Nether Largi North. And into the Bronze Age, this is one of the few places where cut marks, here they are again, are found in association now with carvings which appear to depict some of the earliest metal axe heads. So there's a major transitioning happening that Kilmartin is very much a part of, maybe at the center of, and Rock art is itself changing, maybe in response, maybe partly causing these transformations at other monuments in the landscape. So that to me suggests that the meaning and significance of rock art was always shifting. It was always being renegotiated. And not only have we inherited this extraordinary prehistoric legacy. But as Ronald Morris's list reminds us, we continue to reinterpret its significance today. That's where I'm going to finish. And thank you so much for listening.